Murray. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. of death and defeat stared me in the face. But I can close my eyes even now and feel again that exhaustion and faintness that I dared not let any man see. It was a nightmare pause in a nightmare battle. Two partially disabled ships drifting rapidly apart, and each with no purpose than to patch its wounds and return to destroy the other. I can see the nativity had again. Now the score's cleared, sir. How does she bear there are two points on the starboard beam, sir. Ah. There. Uh-huh. She's hope too. Looks a bit lopsided without her foremost. Mm. Hmm. Seems to have made no attempt as yet to rig a new one. Well, as soon as we can carry it and sail off, so as we can beat the wind over, he'll have it at our mercy. We must try and do it before nightfall, Mr. Bush, and, and or we may lose her altogether in the dark. And uh, now what's this? The funeral party, sir. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> Already going out there. Uh, <clears throat> how many? Fourteen. Very well. Mr. Bush, have all hands stop work, but remain where they are. I intend no disrespect to the dead, but this ceremony must be swift or the living may be endangered. Aye, aye, sir. under the bottom and seems to be holding. I've been able to release all but 20 men from the pump. Good. Everything ready now for hoisting the mast. All ready, sir. Right. Now, Mr. Bush, it is important that nobody should haul or carry out any movement except by orders. I shall try to use the pitching of the ship to help in the raising of the mast. And if any man acts without my orders, I'll have him flogged. Aye, aye, sir. Hands to the windlass. And Mr. Jell, I'll attend to those swings. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Galbraith. Never do it. The ropes will slip off the mast. Eh? If they drift away from that stump, it'll sweep the deck like a broadside. You trust the old man. He knows what he's doing. Oh, if he does, turn to go there. Oh, 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 Indeed, by the 
the time the long and dangerous struggle with the mast was over and it stood vertical at last while the men fished it firmly to the stump of the old mizzen, I was sick with weariness. I'd been on my quarter deck for over eight hours with neither rest nor food. And through the stress and labor of the battle. I was beginning to find it difficult to concentrate upon anything. So that Bush had spoken twice before I could force myself to listen. I said, sir, that it's a magnificent piece of work, if you'll allow me to say so, sir. Um, shall I send up the topmast and yards now, sir? I fear it'll be useless to attempt to carry any canvas in this wind and seems to Bush. And the Pacific Dad is barely in sight now. Uh, just a smudge on the horizon, sir. Aye. There's not much chance of renewing the action till the wind takes off a bit. Yes, I cannot imagine the Admiral accepting that statement in a report. But it's true enough, sir. We're badly knocked about, and the weather's too rough to carry on the fight. Nevertheless, the report will be received with pitying smiles, Mr. Bush. The excuse is too old, like the uncharted rock which always causes a wreck. The Admiral is 10,000 miles away, and they can't judge the strength of this storm from there. Yes, even though I should be accused of cowardice, there's nothing I can do until the weather moderates. No, sir, there's not. But in that case, sir, why not take a rest? You look mortally tired, sir. Indeed you do. Well, let me send and have a berth screened off for you in the wardroom. Little six, Mr. Bush, it's you who need a rest. Dismiss the starboard watch and go below and turn in. While the enemy is in sight, I shall stay on deck. But, sir, I think... I the... gave you an order, Mr. Bush. Aye, aye, sir. Good fellow, Bush, but uh, a fool, a sentimental fool. He'd treat me like an old woman if I'd let him. Hmm. Yes, I wonder how Lady Barbara is getting on that. Oh, confound it. He has that idiot of a steward now. Can't anybody leave me alone? Well, Paul, Will, what do you want? Well, I've been to attend to the lady, sir. I screened off a bit of the all up for us, sir. The all up? But the wounded are in there. Well, they're mostly quiet now, sir. And, well, I couldn't leave her in my cable tier. Oh. I've stung the hammock for her, and she's... <laughs> she nipped into it like a bird, sir. <laughs> Took a bit of grub, too, and a glass of wine, she did. Oh, very good, Paul Will. Well, now, it stands to reason, sir. A frigate in the sea like this, and a battle like lot with what we've had is... Well, it's a bit rough on an high-born lady. Just confine yourself to facts and keep your opinions to yourself, Paul Will. The high-born lady joined this ship of her own free will, knowing that she was about to go into action. Aye, aye, sir. Now, uh, about you, sir. Here's some dry clothes from your chest in the storeroom. Well, I'm afraid the last broadside done for everything in your cabin. Well, I don't want any dry clothes. Uh, of course you don't, sir. No, I wouldn't suggest it, except in... Well, if your pig's cold, sir, you won't be fit when we catch us up with a nativity. Will it change up here, sir, or come below? Uh, <clears throat> now, now, look. If I just lash this here hammock chair to the rail, sir... You could sit there when you've changed and have this biscuit and rum, couldn't you, sir? <coughs> and this here boat cloak will keep some of the spray off you. But you won't have to leave the deck. Paul oh, Will, are you presuming to give me orders? Orders, sir? Me? <laughs> I hope so knows my place, sir. Hmm. It's all right, Mr. Bush, sir. You can turn in now. <laughs> Captain's in his chair and sleeping like a baby, sir. <laughs> Oh, good heavens, I must have dozed off. Mm. What time is it, I wonder? Well, impossible, it's after midnight. As black as the Earl of Hell's riding boots. Hmm, feels to me as though the weather's improving. Let's have a look at the binnacle. Ah, Mr. Bush. Wind's shifting southerly and moderated, sir. Uh, Wish there's a bit of starlight even. I can't see a thing. The Tividad might be 20 miles away or only 200 yards. Yes, I doubt she's close. She was going away to leeward rapidly when we last saw her. She can't have carried out all the repairs she'll need in this weather. What do you think she'll do, sir? Mm, that fellow Crespo who commands her is no fool. <clears throat> I believe he'll try to avoid us until he can get into the Gulf of Fonseca and refit. He'd like us to follow him into the Gulf, so he'd have the advantage of the shore batteries as well. But he can't make much sail in his crippled condition, sir. But even if he could, the wind is wrong for getting to the Gulf. I had observed that fact, Mr. Bush. I believe he'll reach far out to sea and claw southwards as far as he can. 
I shall return to my chair until daylight and attempt to work out what is likely to be his position at dawn. Aye, aye, sir. Morning, sir. The sea's going down fast, sir, and the wind's taken off. The sun will be up in ten minutes. Yes, we'll make sail, if you please, Mr. Bush. Here is the course you are to sail. But as I gave the course, I knew that it was sheer guesswork. Every yard I sailed might be away from the Tatavid Dad while she hurried to safety. My heart was heavy with misgiving, for I knew that if I had failed, there would be many who would attribute that failure to incompetence or cowardice. over the horizon, I paced the quarterdeck with every appearance of unconcern, determined not to allow anyone to guess at the doubts and fears which tormented me. When the light should be sufficient for the masthead lookout to scan the horizon, I might be justified or ruined. Yet even my resolution to remain calm must have wavered when my gloomy thoughts were pierced by a wild cry from aloft. <laughs> We found her, sir. We found her. You are right again, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Look, sir. You can see her from here with the glass. Dead ahead. Yeah. Ah. ah, she's coming round, sir. She's running away. Yes, Crespo wishes to postpone action. He prefers discretion to heroics, and quite rightly, Mr. Bush. However, set every stitch we can carry, send the hands to breakfast. If we engage, there's no telling when they'll eat again, if ever. Aye, aye, sir. Hands to breakfast. <laughs> We're gaining, sir. She'll not get away this time. We'll blow her right out of the water. Never underestimate your opponent, Mr. Bush. Those 24 pounders of hers are heavy metal. We have a ship which is leaking like a sieve, has a makeshift rig, and is 64 men short. And our firing force is far inferior to hers. Do you think the wind's going to hold, sir? Mm. Seems to me as if the sun's swallowing it. Oh, it's getting mighty hot, too. It'll be just our luck to lose the wind now. I can't trim it anymore. Hi! You're at the wheel. Oh, here's small blast you. I can't, sir, begging your pardon. There ain't enough wind. Damn it, he's right. The wind's gone, sir. And look at that sky. It's like brass. But in a dead calm and well out of range. We will tow with the boats. Have the launch and cutter hoisted out. Boats away. Cutter's crew. Launch is through. <laughs> Well, then, men, you've got a hard task, but it must be done. You've got to pull. Pull till your muscles crack and your hands burst. Now, get your clothes off and pull naked. I'll have you relieved in an hour. Now, pull! All together, give way! <laughs> Thank you. 
Nothing. Not more than two hits. Mr. Galbraith, let that main gun and stay. Strike directly. Aye, sir. Mr. Bush, at what distance would you, would you station it now? Oh, three parts of a mile, I should say, sir. Uh, so I think. I, I fear our carronades will not be effective at that distance. Relieve the boat's crews and see if fresh men can pull us nearer. Aye, aye, sir. It was intolerably hot. The smell of pitch from the deck seems the bitter tang of powder and the smell of the blood from the wounded, combined with my fatigue and anxiety to make me feel deathly sick. I feared to disgrace myself by being sick in front of the men. They, too, no longer joked at the guns. They were beginning to sulk under punishment. It was a bad sign. Sullivan! Sir! Here, Sullivan! You your fiddle? Aye, sir, I have that. Well, that's when we'll have a hornpipe. Benskin, Hall, oh, McAvoy. A hornpipe from each of you and a guinea for the man that does his best. On <laughs> my word, Mr. Gerard, this will be a tale told and retold in years to come. How Captain Hornblower had his ship towed into action with hornpipes being danced on her main deck.
Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.